So it turns out color is kind of weird. But color wasn't always weird. Uh, in primary school, color was really simple. We were taught that you got red, green, and yellow paints, and you could mix them together and make any color in the spectrum. It got a little bit more nuanced when we learned about the work of Newton and his experiment with white light going into a prism, and that explained that color was just made up of different wavelengths and spectrums of light. But um, color was simple. Uh, color started getting complicated when I started learning about light. Light was fascinating. Light was weird. Light had both wave and particle properties. There was Thomas Young who did the double slit experiment. Um, and there was Einstein with the photoelectric effect. And this stuff was fascinating to me. The world of quantum physics was fascinating to me. And I was a big nerd, so I started reading the biographies of the Western scientists that I was exposed to who were involved in the, the discovery and understanding of quantum physics. And one of the biographies I read was that of Erwin Schrodinger. He was a fascinating guy, and like most biographies, uh, the book begins with his early childhood, and then I was expecting it to go into sort of, you know, the grounding for his work in quantum physics. But it didn't. It went into color. I'm like, why in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, are we still thinking about color? I mean, this was solved. Color is just a physical property of things, and light interacts with it, and light's the interesting stuff. Color is, is, is boring. Turns out I was wrong. What uh, Schrodinger was doing was he was reconciling two different schools of thought about color. There was one school of thought that sort of went back to you know, ancient history and sort of color theory, and Goethe was a, a big philosopher and proponent thinking about how humans interact with color, and he was responding to the work of Newton. Then on the other side, you had uh, Newton leading into folks like Young from Young's Slit Experiment and Helmholtz um, from a lot of things, including Helmholtz tuning on pianos, which we don't use today, but is interesting. And so you had these two sort of schools, this perceptual school and this sort of physical school. And what Schrodinger was doing was showing that mathematically, using the work of Maxwell, um, that these two schools were identical, um, that the math sort of worked out the same. And this was fascinating to me, that we were still grappling with color when we were grappling with the complexities of quantum physics. And to understand why color is weird, you sort of have to realize, and this was the light bulb moment that I had at the time, that color is not a physical property of things. Yes, light interacts with bodies, electrons move into different shells, they emit and reflect and absorb different wavelengths, and there's black body radiation and all that sort of stuff. But color is something that we perceive. An object isn't red. An object is perceived as red. And to understand why it's so weird, you have to start understanding how the eye works. Now, I have the fortune, I guess, of being the son of an ophthalmologist whose brother, my uncle, is a physicist who specializes in optics. And uh, so I have some vague understanding of these things. So to understand how the eye works, it's interesting to contrast first with the ear, which is a different organ altogether. The way the ear works, <laughs> I'm going down a rabbit hole, is you have a cone um, that uh, is broad at the, the start of the ear canal and sort of narrows out and it's wrapped around and it's uh, what we call the cochlea. And what this does is the way sound resonates inside this cone is that there's broad resonance in the large areas and smaller resonance in the smaller areas. And effectively, there are little hair cells wrapped around this cochlea that, represent a low, that respond to low frequency noises and high frequency noises and middle frequency noises. So effectively, what the ear is doing is like a fast Fourier transform, a physical fast Fourier transform of the sound that's coming in and then sending that across the auditory nerve to the brain. That's a lot more complicated than that. But basically what's happening in the ear is the ear is breaking up the sounds that we hear into the component frequencies. The eye is not doing that. Yes, a spectrum exists in, a, in sort of the physical reality. The light produces a very broad, sorry, the sun produces a, a very broad spectrum of light. The lights in this office produce broad spectrums of light and they interact with the physical objects that surround us. But the eye is dumber um, in many ways. The eye really only has four light sensors. Uh, there are the rods, which respond to the brightness and darkness, the brightness of light, and they also uh, respond to fast frequencies. And then there are cones. Most humans have three cones, and they respond to three different sort of chunks of the visible uh, light spectrum. Um, this is weird. The eye is really weird. The retina is weird. Um, it doesn't just, the eye is not like, the retina is not like a CCD sensor like in a camera that sends a, a, an array of, of light intensities back to the brain. You have blind spots, you have weird peripheral vision versus central vision. Um, you don't have color perception all the way around uh, the back of your retina. Uh, the eye and the human body and the brain is highly uh, sensitive to edges and contrast. 
And so that actual edge detection is not done in the brain, it's done in the retina. So the signal that the brain gets is, is really complicated, but the perception of color is really defined by how these three different color sensors work, the rods, sorry, the cones. Uh, let's dive into a sheet of paper and I'll start drawing some things out and we'll go into why color is weird. Let's start off by looking at the spectrum of light or electromagnetic radiation. It extends on infinitely. Down here we have radio waves. Up here we have sort of infrared. The eye can see sort of roughly between 400 and 700 nanometers of wavelength. Again, it's hard to wrap my arm around this tripod that's in the way. But um, this sort of region is sort of no accident. It's evolution that's led to us having color perception or light perception in this range. This corresponds, if you zoom out a bit and you look at the spectrum of light coming out of the sun, we're sort of focusing in the human eye in this range here. Now, as I was saying, there are three receptors that were traditionally, and in the time of Young and Helmholtz, thought of as the red, green, and blue uh, sensors, but now we call them the short, medium, and long uh, cones. And the short sort of responds to frequencies of light in that range, medium sort of looks like that, and long sort of looks like that. And so S, M, L, this is sort of around 430 nanometers peak. This is like, I don't know what, 500-ish, and this is like 550. These guys overlap a lot. Um, these are just rough numbers. Now, what these uh, cone cells are doing is that any light that falls within their range of sensitivity basically gets integrated by this as sort of like a weight, a sensitivity weight. So if you take the sum of all the light falling in this area, multiply it by the cone's sensitivity um, to those different frequencies, uh, you'll get the response coming out of the short cone cells, likewise for the medium and long cone cells in the eye. So effectively the eye, and again, it's a gross simplification, is getting three numbers from each region in the retina. It's getting some number responding to the intensity of S, some number responding to the intensity of L, M, and L. And so you can start to see why we start thinking of light as having three primary colors. Now, in primary school, we were learning about the subtractive colors. Uh, drawing uh, Venn diagrams of color with a black pen is not great, where we were told it was red, yellow, and blue. It's actually cyan, magenta, and yellow. But when you're talking about additive light, say the light coming out of the computer monitor, it's a slightly different set of three primaries. It is red, green, and blue. And the colors appearing in here, are respectively, these three colors there. And likewise, these three colors here represent the red, green, and blue. Math. So computer monitors are an interesting case study in light because Whereas the eye is looking at physical objects that have sort of random spectra of light that might sort of look like that, that we'll perceive as being one color, all computer monitors can do is what their phosphors or the filters in the case of LCDs can produce. You might have a blue phosphor that corresponds to sort of this frequency range here and it's not monochromatic, there's gonna be, you can produce that frequency with one phosphor, you might be able to produce that frequency with another phosphor and that frequency with the, the red phosphor. Now, the way that a computer monitor can make any color, in, in air quotes, is by interpolating. Because we know that we're doing this integration process here. If we get the ratio of this phosphor and this phosphor right, we can represent how the eye perceives this wavelength. Likewise, if we get the integration of these two phosphors right, you can get how the eye perceives, you can trick the eye into believing it sees this color. Now, obviously, phosphors aren't perfect for, for, for generating color. You know, we can't generate colors down here if our phosphor is here. Likewise, we can't generate colors here if our phosphor is limited to this. But it provides a pretty natural way for computers and electronics to think about color. Rather than thinking about short, medium, and long, we think about blue, green, and red intensities. And so if you've done any web coding or HTML coding, you might be you know, familiar with you know, A, A, B, B, C, C, representing the R, G, B components in hex of a particular color. 
So there's an entire world of mathematics and science and colorimetry involved in making sure that two computer monitors display the same color when you give them the same RGB triplet. Or if you're printing something using a subtractive process like CMYK printing, that what you see on your screen is uh, what you get on the sheet of paper. And there's a really good video uh, that it was by a guy, I think his name's John Austin. He gave a talk at Strange Loop last year on the standards process and the, the, the way that we sort of translate from different play technologies and printing technologies. And it's really interesting. That's primarily looking at RGB or XYZ color spaces. RGB or XYZ, which is a linear transform of RGB set by an international standards body in 1931. Now, RBB. Uh, GB. Anyway. Uh, all these color space things that he talks about are all vector spaces. They're all linear spaces. They're all spaces where the uh, triangle inequality hold. And this is really convenient for doing a whole range of mathematics on color. And this is where we're starting to get into electronics and computer stuff. Let's say you have two images with a bunch of pixels, so rows and columns and you want to morph or just interpolate so that you fade from one picture to the next picture. And each of these pixels here is defined by an RGB triplet. This is RGB1, this is RGB2. To make any sort of in-between frame between these two images, you can simply do linear interpolation where R of T where t is the time from starting at this image to going to that image, is equal to t of r1 plus 1 minus t of r2, where t goes from 0 to 1. And that just gives you a linear interpolation of the red, the green, and the blue. And when you do that, you end up with, um, from a perception perspective, a fairly seamless transition. If you want to make something brighter, you just multiply all these numbers by some factor. If you want to make it darker, you divide them by some factor. And, and a lot of really simple mathematics can work in RGB. If you go back to the days before sort of Super VGA and you go back to CGA and VGA and EGA graphics, um, all the colors were defined sort of just by RGB space because that was naturally what to do because your phosphors in your CRTs or your colors in your LCD were simply red, green, and blue. So if you did your math where like in CGA, roughly, this is an old color standard, um, there were three different levels for red, green, and blue that you could mix together to make 16 colors, I believe, in a palette, of which you can only display four at a time, but whatever. So you could have red being equal to zero, a half, or one, likewise for green and blue. And so really simple numbers, really easy to represent in binary. So these RGB linear color spaces, and there's a variety of them, are good for doing math, particularly on low power computers. But there are some problems with the RGB color space. If you have a color that is 50% red and 50% blue, it doesn't feel perceptually as bright to us as a color that's 50% blue and 50% green. Even though the intensity value is the same, the area under those curves sort of integrate to the same, turns out humans are a little bit more complicated than that. You know, we grew up and we live in worlds where the sky is blue, where plants are green, where things that are frequently dangerous are red, yellow, and orange. So we have different perceptual relationships to color. And these are nonlinear. These are not living in a nice metric space, in a nice linear vector space. And so, uh, as I said, that, that talk from that guy, um, he did a good uh, background on the, the, the lab color space. Uh, which is L star A star B star, which is supposed to be uh, a nonlinear remapping from X, Y, Z, or which is an, an RGB space, to, to this space, which better represents um, how humans respond perceptually to different colors. And this is a nonlinear space. And so what that means is a lot of the mathematical operations that are easy to do in these color spaces are difficult to do or don't lead to physically natural results in this color space. You can't take an image in lab and interpolate to another image in lab and get sort of a smooth transition using that uh, linear interpolation that I talked about before. Because uh, it's not linear. But there are some interesting phenomenon that, phenomenons, phenomena that happen when you're working in this space doing sort of good, easy computer math. 
and that's the phenomenon that uh, is called coda colors. It's uh, probably something you've seen. It may not be something that you've got a, a name to, uh, but in the demo scene, uh, coda colors were a pretty common phenomenon. And that was the phenomenon of doing math in the RGB space to make new colors, doing very simplistic sort of binary math, low computationally intensive math um, that was all linear. And you ended up with uh, very vivid uh, images that didn't look quite right. Uh, if you know Vaporwave today or, or things like that or glitch art, this is often in the realm of coda colors where you're getting either purposefully or unpurposefully in the case of glitch stuff happening in the RGB color space. If you want to do things that are a little bit more natural, you need to work in one of these color spaces like Lab or HSV. HSV is a good intermediate between the RGB space, RGB space and the Lab space. There is a direct, nice, simple transform from RGB to HSV and vice versa. So what is HSV? HSV is hue saturation value. Hue is the sort of the fundamental frequency, the, the, the raw underlying color. It's often depicted in a circle, starting with red, wrapping around and coming back to red. I can't remember whether green is here and blue is here, but you get this sort of cycle and this represents sort of an, a rolling up of the vis visible spectrum from 400 to 700. So that's hue. Saturation is then the ratio between this uh, color and white. So you can have red, which is the pure hue. You can have pink, which is an unsaturated red um, because there's more white mixed in. So if you think of white as being the center here, your hue is where you are on the circle then saturation is how far you are from the center of that circle, which is white, out to there. Then value is you can imagine extending this to being a cylinder where you have black down here. B-L-A-C-K, black, where you have your colors around here, your hues around here, you have white running down the center, so it's white up here, it's gray down here, it's black down there, and you get a sort of a cone or a cylinder of colors. Now, there's a bit of complicated math. Well, not complicated math, but um, it's non-linear math to go from RGB to this color space. But this is the sort of color space where you get more natural looking outcomes when you apply more interesting math to the underlying color objects. Now, I've been working on a project uh, that's in component color. Now, component is a variant of RGB. As I said in a previous video, uh, component has Luma. I misspoke before and called it luminance. There's a difference between luma and luminance. It's not that important. Um, which is the brightness, which is sort of this V value here. Um, then you have the PR and the PG signals, which is the red minus luma and the green uh, PB, the blue minus luma. So this is a linear transform of the RGB space so that any sort of operations I'm doing electronically, whether it's through digital electronics or through analog electronics, mean that I'm just doing, uh, for the most part, linear math when you're using non-active components in an effectively an RGB-like color space, which means you end up with coda colors, which is cool. It's, it's, it's definitely a look, it's definitely a vibe, but a more beautiful color space to work in is, are these sort of color spaces. So when I've done uh, computer graphics programming uh, for artistic purposes or even for information visualization purposes, I prefer to work in these sort of color spaces where you can do linear interpolations that get you more natural perceptive responses to color. That's kind of all I wanted to talk about uh, in this video. I can go deep in a lot of this sort of stuff. I think I've been rambling. I think I covered the cochlea and the ear. Um, I don't know if I went into the X-linked chromosomal nature of cones and tetrachromy in women. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting stuff here. Um, I didn't want to make another video on electronics today. I've been finding that by making the videos on electronics, it's been driving what I've been doing with my electronics rather than the other way around. So I'm going to keep on working on the electronics in the background. I'm going to upload this video as a quick introduction to the weird world alt of color. And let me know if this stuff's interesting to you. I can go in any direction, or at least I can try. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave it there. Welcome to the world of color. It's weird.